on the dot. Thank you, Amy, for doing that. I want to check one thing here real quick. All right, we're ready to roll. All right, it's 10 o'clock. We are going to get started here for our section managers meeting centered around soccer. Um, so first off, thank you for um, for for playing your role in uh, the postseason aspect of um, MSHSL soccer this year. Um, I'm going to do my best to get through this meeting uh, and share all the information that we need to so that you are well equipped to to have all of your questions answered or be able to answer questions that might pop up um, in in a, a postseason hosting of events. So um, I'm, I am on here. Amy Ince is on here. And then very conveniently, Emmett Keenan and Scott McCready, who are tournament manager at the state tournament and assistant tournament manager are on the call as well. So um, we're going to run through things. This is a small um, there's a small group of people in attendance on here. So if we have questions that do pop up or we need to slow down and get something going, um, we can definitely do that. Normally in this meeting, we also have uh, in attendance and sharing uh, Laura Mockentoon and Tim Layton uh, on the communication. So like website, things along those lines and media side, Amy Ince and I will take those uh, today and share some of that information out. And then if there are any further questions or details needed on the website and the media aspect of it, um, you can reach out to Amy and I, and we can get answers directly from Tim and and uh, and Laura, or you can reach out to them as well. Um, I'm sure all of you, just looking at the faces on this call, have had some sort of communication with uh, with Laura or Tim in the past as well. Um, also, just before we get into the meat of everything, we do have Greg Juba and Keith Randa on the call as well. Uh, I thought I saw Keith on here. Maybe it just dropped off. My apologies. Um, but, uh, we do have soccer coaches association also represented, um, well in a couple of different roles, but the uh, aspect of the coaches association represented as well. So, um, we're going to hop into it here. If we look at our agenda real quick, we've got, um, quite a few things on here and we're going to, like I said, mention Amy and I will hop into some of the website requirements, uh, review of our materials, um, section tournament chain of communication, uh, section tournament management, and that's largely our section manager's guide here that uh, that was attached, I believe, um, to your meeting invite, uh, consistency and communication, uh, the official squad, that's really a subset, I feel, of consistency and communication, but it's it's got its own piece there, some of the medical protocols, and then general information that kind of comes back to this um, section manager's guide checklist, and, and then... Um, you know, getting the information to the, the schools that are qualifying to move on in advance to the state tournament. So let's go ahead here and hop into some of the website stuff. And Amy, do you want to do you want to take over at this point and start to share some of that website information off their dashboard? Yep. Thanks, Phil. Um, just to start off, uh, each person that's assisting with your tournament should have a ter tournament personnel dashboard. If they don't, um, you can contact us at this email address here and we can help set that up for them. We would help them set up their dashboard page and then the region secretary would be responsible for assigning them to the section events. Um, if you serve in multiple roles like Scott McCready does, um, when you log on to your dashboard page, you'll have some links here to toggle back and forth between the multiple dashboards that you might have. So um, for these purposes, we're gonna be looking at your tournament personnel dashboard. On your tournament personnel dashboard, this website help guide is linked, um, talks about multiple things that we're going to go over today, um, how to manage your section event, edit brackets, um, things like that. So this is linked on your tournament personnel dashboard, um, but it's also a good idea to bookmark this website help guide. These folders are also linked on your tournament personnel dashboard, and we will be adding documents to the soccer folder behind this button 
um, multiple times as we approach your section tournament. So the section manager's guide is in there now, rules and policies, Minnesota modifications are in there. Um, there's some emergency planning documents that are in there and we will continue to add documents. So um, locate this on your tournament personnel dashboard page as well. Um, you can bookmark the soccer folder in that behind that button also. These are two more buttons on your tournament personnel dashboard um, for finding ADs who are taking part in your section tournament and coach information for those taking part in your section tournament. Both of these directories can be filtered down by activity, by region, by class, et cetera. And you have three main tasks as they relate to your section events um, that we'll go over briefly on the next couple slides. Um, you're going to add, if you haven't already, section event information that the public will see, dates, times, and venues. You're going to add event information for participating schools that the coaches and ADs of the schools participating in your section tournament will see on their dashboard. And then you're going to edit and update your brackets as your tournament begins, as you do seating for it, and as you progress through your section tournament. So first off, um, and many of you have done this already when I went in and checked, you're just going to add some basic dates and venue information. And this is what the public sees. So if they search our section tournaments and they search for um, section 1A girls soccer, they're just going to see an overview of the dates and the venues. And your venue information can be as simple as a high seed or high seeds through quarters and semis, and then at St. Charles High School for finals, et cetera. If any of this information changes from what you've entered, please um, keep it updated as best you can. Um, if you have a rain date or something like that, please keep that updated. And these are directions in the website help guide for where you edit that section information if you need to. The region secretary may enter this or the section tournament manager can edit and enter this information. Second piece is posting documents for the participating schools in your section tournament. The directions are in the website help guide under adding a section event. And this is what it looks like on a coaches or ADs dashboard. They're gonna to go to their activity that lists your section. These activity resources here are things that we at the high school league add to dashboard pages. So that's things like the preseason memo, um, rules and policies are linked there, um, things, resources that, that they'll need throughout the season. We also add state tournament resources here in this section. So that would be information about the qualifying schools meeting, the participating schools guide, bus parking at US Bank Stadium, things like that. We enter here under state tournament resources. The information that you put is gonna go in the center section under section tournament resources. And it's only visible to those coaches and ADs who are in your section for soccer. Um, so it's very specific. It's not going to be visible by everybody. Um, things you might include in there would be seating information, um, when the brackets will be posted, et cetera. So again, this information is just for coaches and ADs that are participating in your section event. And then the last thing is um, the brackets. Your brackets are all set up already and are assigned to your section event. Information about how to edit your brackets um, is in the website help guide under brackets and you all have a bracket management button on your dashboard. Going to the next slide, we do have a new feature with brackets that specifically impact soccer this year. And that is, and I believe I'll give a shout out to Greg Juba, this came from his request. So instead of just being able to enter a final score at the end of a soccer game, you now have an extended game option where you can enter overtime or shootout information. Um, number of overtimes, and it'll display on your bracket like this. Um, if you have a shootout, um, one of the options for extended game in your bracket is a shootout, and you can enter the shootout score. If the shootout ended four to three, it's going to say over in this section here, SO four to three. And you're still going to enter the final match score, um, and you can enter information behind this blue uh, button for any additional details that you want to see, but it will show overtime or shootout information right in your bracket. And there's additional information in that website help guide about extended games and how to enter that information. Perfect. Bill, I'm going to turn it back over to you for this. Slide. Awesome. Yep. Thank you for that, Amy. Now, and I will, I'll 
also throw out a reminder of the, we're recording this video. So we went through some of these things and we're moving relatively fast because we're trying to be respectful of the, of your day and a lot of other things that are going on. You can always go back and review, review the video that Amy will post, but then also you can also reach out to us, um, including Laura and Tim who are not on, be able to on the, be they're not able to be on the call today i can speak english i promise uh they're not able to be on the call today you can always reach out to them as well if there's any help needed around navigating the website navigating entering information into your brackets and things along those lines so let's hop into this a little bit these these all kind of fall into our consistency and communication piece um there's a, a three options centered around the seating aspect of it um and these are things that will 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 be worked out really at and you'll receive direction from the region level but you've got face-to-face -face electronic or um the ability to use a, a qrf type of system in there uh, again you'll, you'll receive guidance from your region on all of those different things um you know there's been a lot of talk around seating in other places uh, around the league and i would say soccer is one of the spots where there's been a relatively consistent um a, a agreement on how things are going to roll so we just haven't had a whole ton of drama around that um at, at, at soccer um if you know emma and scott if you feel any different around that one feel free to to chime in but i have i we have not really had a whole ton on that one and so i would say keep doing what you're doing on that front um from the from the consistency piece here um um, on the seating side of things. Moving forward, the pre-contest administrative medical timeout. I'm seeing a couple of different ADs on this call. Um, all of you have heard of, of this promoted in our area meetings. Uh, this is one thing that, um, uh, just to touch on quickly, um, in most of our varsity contests, the, the checklist that happens in this pre-contest timeout is already kind of happening. It's a, it's a quick check from a health and safety standpoint. Where's the athletic trainer located? Where's the AED um, from a game administration standpoint? What happens for game ending procedures if we've got a storm that pops up and we've got to um, sus suspend the game or, or terminate the contest, stuff, different things along those lines. These are all things that are generally talked about at the scores table at the beginning of a game. Um, we've talked about it at, at length in our area meetings because we're trying to help ADs have a tool to, to, um, ensure those same precautions are taken in your lower level contest as well, not just the ones that are well staffed and um, and are at the focal point of your community. So um, same thing goes. Feel free to, to use this. They should most most teams at this point should be used to this quick, you know, two to four minute conversation that happens uh, before the contest gets going where some of these different things are talked about. So um, there's, there's cards that were shared out. The regions also have cards and there's different, there's a toolkit in your dashboard that has uh, resources that you could utilize as well. And so you see the link down there that Amy was just circling with the cursor. Um, that's all there as well. But again, you'll have toolkits um, that are on your dashboards that you could tap into um, as well on that front. Let's hop into a couple of media things, Amy. So Tim shared some media information with me. Um, if you have any questions or if your region secretary has any questions, they should uh, go back to Tim with those. You do have a media page button on your dashboard. Talks about streaming, media access, um, the approved media list, suggested fee structure, any streaming requests, live or delayed, need to go through your region secretary. One thing Tim um, wanted to stress was consider, are you able at your section sites to provide a workspace for media following the games? Where is that? Um, and what does that look like for them? You want to communicate that with uh, media that attend your section events. Any media that are entering your section events have to be on the approved media list that's linked on that button on your dashboard page, on our media page, um, and shown right here. There's no exceptions to that. Um, as site administrators at your section event, it's helpful if you designate a photo zone for your photographers attending your games to show where they can be and equally as important where they cannot be, where they cannot take photographs from. Similar, um, a post-game interview zone, it's helpful to set up um, a designated area for that um, following your game. 
you have the ability or your section manager has the ability to limit um, and manage press box access and accommodations for the media. Again, questions um, on anything regarding the media should go through Tim Layton um, or through your region secretary. Phil, do you have anything to add there? Nope. I think that communication piece with your region secretary is really going to be your big, um, your, your, I guess your main point of contact in there. And then Tim will also be in communication with that press list and, and things like that. But again, don't hesitate to reach out more communication. Um, even if there are questions to, to make sure you're cleared up before things go is always better than being reactionary later on. All right, let's hop into a little bit of a review of some different documents. There's a couple of points that I'll spend a little bit longer time on. And again, I know all of you can read and, and go back and reference this video and these slides at a later point. So I want to be timely in this in this communication. So I mentioned earlier the fall, excuse me, I'm sorry, the, the guide, section manager's guide that's in your fall tournament document folder. Uh, I'll show you that here in a slide in a second. Um, but this is really to be used as a checklist for you to to run through to make sure that all of your bases are covered uh amy and i have gone through that several different times over the course of the the three years that we've been working through working together on this and i feel that that document's pretty tied in um as to what you need uh from a hiring standpoint from a, a website standpoint from you know how to to deal with concessions or the you know having having the right balls at the site whether it's warm up and game game balls and stuff along those lines. So um, all of that stuff is really housed in this document. And this is a this is probably your, I would say, your center point piece uh, centered around your your event there. So um, the rules and policies in the NFHS rule book, having those accessible, um, uh, having them, uh, you know, kind of at a quick we're, we can grab these immediately to reference if we need to is a big piece. So uh, like having, I, I personally like having a hard copy of both of those um, at the scores tables for the different events uh, and making sure that the ADs at your host sites have those on hand to, you know, at their disposal uh, in a quick in a quick situation that they need to reference, they are right there. And it's not a searching around for the, through the NFHS website to get logged on, to go to the, the, the NFHS rules book for soccer, all those things. It's so much easier just to have it there um, and have that at your disposal if needed. Uh, emergency action plans. Um, again, if any of you that were in area meetings, they, these are things that we talked about on that anyone can save a life website and in that preseason contest timeout, all of your different sites, um, should have EAPs that they're currently operating under. Uh, it should be, you know, one of the good things about postseason is they've had, you know, 10 weeks to get their stuff in order. So most of, most of the places that you're going to be hosting um, section events are going to have those already in place. Uh, make sure that the people that you have coming in to assist are familiar with those EAPs as well. Um, for, you know, if there's a situation, again, reaction time is so important and so crucial in that people being familiar or at least having an idea on what they should be doing in an emergency situation um, is critical. Um, I'm not sure some of you heard about the situation that happened at one of the member schools um, two nights ago. And um, full transparency, the, the athletic trainer or the EMTs, I believe, said that if, the, if an AED wasn't in close proximity and in the, and using the capacity it was in the time frame that we'd have a different story on our hands. And so, uh, again, just knowing those things, um, put us in a position to be able to be more effective, uh, in implementing those, uh, post-season tiebreaker, severe weather, um, uh, severe weather and air quality, and then mercy rule. These are all different pieces that you can find in our Minnesota modifications, our rules and policies. Um, and well, the severe air, severe weather piece is a separate one, but um, we talk about postseason tiebreaker, mercy rule, all those different things. Again, that's why I reference utilizing those rules and policies and Minnesota modifications and having hard copies of those both. Um, suspended game policy is a new one for this year. So the coaches association had an advisory proposal that went through and uh it was a good it was a it's got some good language centered around getting soccer up to uh speed with what some of the other outdoor programming 
um, programming standards would be centered around suspended games. So familiarize yourself with that language. Um, the cliff notes of that language is if a contest is either tied or uh, the first half has not been completed, then that game will be played from the point of suspension versus being played from the start. The old language had you restarting the game. And two years ago, we had uh, what, what brought this on was two years ago, there was a, uh, a contest that was being played. It was a semifinal game. And they were in the last 10 minutes of overtime. And lightning struck 9.9 miles away. And the official <laughs> decided that we were going to call that game at that point. Not arguing that fact. Um, but because of that, the old language meant that that game had to be replayed from the start. So now the team played a full game and overtime. The next day they played their full game, which went into overtime as well. And the winner went on the next day, three days consecutively in a row now, to play the section championship game um, against a a well-rested team uh, against a team that just played two full soccer games and then a third uh, almost in consecutive days. So um, so the Coaches Association did a good job of getting that, that language updated. Again, like I said, it puts it on par with other outdoor sports uh, and what they do in their suspended game situations. Um, and I believe it also is a player safety piece. You know, we're, we're, we're giving some adequate time in between those contests in the event they need to be rescheduled or whatever. So familiarize yourself with that language. Again, it's in rules and policies. It's in Minnesota modifications, and, and you should have that for your staff um, at all the sites. Uh, responsibility for spectator conduct. I'm not going to get into this too much. Everyone is familiar with bylaw 409. I talked about the, the pre-contest timeout aspect. There is a spectator supervision piece of that. Um, so if you utilize that, which I highly recommend, um, that will be talked about in there and who is coming to uh, um, watch the the home and the visitor team um, spectators. And so that's another piece that we're going to hit on. And Amy talked about having the the uh, directory of the schools that are participating is making sure that we have communication with their ADs to know who they're sending to help uh, support the uh, the the spectator um Supervision, excuse me, sorry, a little blank there. Let's go ahead and move forward, Amy, here. So I talked about that fall tournament, fall tournament management documents. Um, on your dashboard here, you'll see this is what the little button icon is. And this will take you to a page where you're able to access all of the different files that, um, that you're going to need access to uh, in running your section tournaments. Let's go ahead and move forward on 18. All right, so I mentioned uh, a scenario a couple of years ago where we had a, uh, a contest be suspended by an official, and um, one of the one of the really good things that we had come out of that was um, our communication was absolutely stellar on how we are going to play this situation, how our how our bylaws and the rules and policies around soccer dictate how we had to do that. Um, and because the the site manager and the region secretary were able to communicate directly with me, we were able to handle it exactly how we were supposed to handle it per the, the rules and policies for the sport of soccer and, um, and the bylaws for MSHSL. It was actually board policy, but you get the point. So um, in, in scenarios like this, it's your local site, your, your local, Boots on the ground at the local site to your tournament manager to region secretary and then MSHSL staff. Um, the good thing is many of you are in communication with me already on some of these different things. So just looping in our region secretary and making sure that um, that everybody is in that chain in the right way. I am not going to overstep my bounds um, and I will not comment on anything that the region secretary and tournament manager haven't been in the loop on. And so though that chain of communication will be respected, but I do appreciate visibility in uh, in some of those situations that we have to navigate. Okay, let's hop down into some tournament management. 
pieces. So uh, I mentioned in, uh, confirming all the teams that are assigned to your section are actually playing and or allowed to participate. Um, there's a piece of that around the spectator management aspect, but we also need to know what teams are able to be able to play in there. So so uh, that directory button that Amy showed earlier allows you to, for easy access to that so that you can communicate there. Um, and then can confirm that your site managers um, have been assigned to all rounds of play. So we, we need boots on the ground at all rounds of play there. Um, and ideally that site manager shouldn't be a, a member of a, any coaching staff of a, of a participating team. So finding a neutral body to do that, um, is going to be crucial. Now, again, many of you, uh, I, these are different roles that a lot of times people do for the regions, uh, or excuse me, the sections, for a long period of time at and in some points and there's kind of like this pride of this is what I do. So I may be preaching to the choir on this and it should, you know, maybe it's something we can condense down, but making sure there's a neutral party there if possible is a, is a, um, a big deal. Um, uh, mentioned earlier about having access to rules and policies, uh, Minnesota modifications, and the NFHS rulebook. Um, again, just familiarizing yourself and your your staff with them. Um, you know, there's there's a comfort level in understanding what some of those changes are um, around the suspended game language or mercy rule that was two years ago an advisory proposal that came through. Uh, so all of those things are listed in there and just having a, 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 a comfort in talking about it. So you're not caught off guard with any questions or situations that might pop up that need to be navigated. So let's go ahead and move forward. All right. Um, talking about that, um, chain of communication. Um, so, um, making sure that all site managers have contact information for the people that they should be reaching out to in uh, emergency situations or if there's a scenario where we've got questions that need to be talked about. Again, I'm a big over-communicate person. Let's answer the questions on the front end, possibly even before they become a question um, to, to alleviate any stressful, stressful situations that could pop up uh, later on. So again, making sure that contact information is, is very clearly communicated to everyone. Um, um, as well as that chain of communication on who they should be reaching out to. So who and how to do so are going to be big for um, all of your site managers. And then um, when in doubt, obviously, as I just mentioned, you can always reach out to me and I'll make sure to loop in the right people in any uh, situations that uh, that do pop up. Um, reporting results, pretty self-explanatory. Immediately uh, after each game, getting that site updated and um, and if there are any questions or needs around that, same thing, connecting with with Laura, um, Amy, or myself on it. All right. Um, another aspect, this kind of ties back into that pre-contest timeout uh, piece and communicating with your officials. Um, we've got to we've got to make sure that if there are ejections, they are submitted ASAP. Um, so we we want to make sure that uh, we don't have a situation where a student athlete is participating after an ejection in the next contest or something like that, um, or even on the sideline. There's there's aspects of uh, bylaw 206 on good standing uh, that uh, during postseason play that need to be um, need to be respected. And for that to happen, um, I need. Um, those officials to be reminded that any ejection reports need to be submitted ASAP so that we can get on them. And then also just reminding the coaches of any of those advancing teams that if they've got a student athlete that's that's been ejected, they need to be having a conversation with their AD. I have just with some of the turnover that happens uh, in AD offices, uh, we actually had a situation this year where there was a transition and no one got the ejection report when our office sent it out. And luckily we followed up on it and we were able to, to make sure that the, the penalty was, was uh, enforced and, and the, the, I guess the constructive educational feedback was given to the, to the, the, the players involved in that situation, but making sure that we're talking to the officials about getting the support, the, the report submitted and the coaches about uh, communicating with their AD. So if they do have a student that is technically not in good standing, they aren't putting the team at jeopardy moving forward. All right. Talked a little bit on the consistency and communication piece already. Um, in, in talking with our region secretaries, 
that we do kind of on a monthly basis. Everything is how are things done at the state tournament so that um, they can the the teams can be trained during the beginning aspects of postseason play that so they can be trained on what to expect during the state tournament. So uh, I'll get into you know different different pieces of. Uh, rosters, benches, all those different things, but we're we're wanting to do as much as we can uh, in unison with the progression of regular season to section tournament to state tournament. So, um, again, having that soccer rules book handy, um, that's our that is our bench document um, as well as the rules and policies and Minnesota modification. Let's go ahead and move forward, Amy, please. Okay, so um, key points on this, as I said, rules and policies, other pertinent information with tournament managers around, like, again, preseason timeout, Minnesota modifications, NFHS rules. Um, and then, as I mentioned just a second ago, um, one of the biggest ones is that bench personnel. Who is allowed on that sideline during the bench? Um, excuse me, on the bench during the game. And at the state tournament, it's 22, 3, and 2. So 22 players, three coaches, two student managers. And so that's what we utilize. Everyone's sidelines are a little bit different at some of these host sites and stuff like that. Um, but having that out of the gate, and, and mo most coaches at this point know, and it's very clear that this is what we're going to have if we get to go to the state tournament. But, um, you know, coaches, you know, try and swap out players and put in a student manager or this or that, you know. So let's just make sure that we're doing the best that we can to make sure that we're holding the standard of what they're going to be held to um, at a later time, um, you know, when if they qualify for the state tournament. Let's go ahead, Amy. So three coaches on the bench, must be school approved, head coach, state statute, uh, head coaching course, um, and then – you know, the last minute coach additions are, are extremely hard because we need to make sure that they are um, they have their CERs completed and all those things. So that that rule of no last minute coach additions is, has really been to protect you and to protect us to make sure that we don't have um, um, on registered coaches or on certified coaches on the sideline interacting with your kids, um, excuse me, your participants in the in the event. So um so each coach should submit a printed team roster with their first and last names um, and all of the uh, numbers for your for the players, substitutes, bench personnel, everyone there at least five minutes prior to the start of the contest. Now, this gets a little bit tricky, okay? Um, it's nice to have a roster in advance, but legally they have up until five minutes before the contest to submit their game roster. And then that roster that they submit is the roster for, for the section tournament. Okay. Um, I, again, this can get a little bit tricky, but NFHS rule allows them to submit that roster um, uh, up to five minutes before the start of the game. Okay. Once that roster is submitted, that is their section tournament roster of their 22, three and two that you should utilize. And then if there's any scenarios where you've got an injury or a kid needs to be swapped out, you have that base roster. Um, again, just because they can submit that there, it might be different than what you're, but that what you ask them to submit in advance, just know that those could change and make sure that you're checking those rosters at the start of that first quarterfinal game or that play in game um, that you're checking that because that is their base roster. That's one thing why I put it in red because people can get hung up on that. And I want all of you to be aware of it. All right. Going back and just kind of hitting on that official roster again, don't need to, don't need to, to harp on it too much here. But the one thing I will say, as I mentioned earlier is 206.6. If you've got a kid um, that is ineligible, they cannot be in uniform or on the team bench if they're not in good standing. So you can go back. Most of you are familiar or, or know about what bylaw 206 is about. You can reference that, but they should not be on the bench uh, if they're not eligible and they definitely should not be in uniform. How many, I, I don't know if it's you know, uh, a whole ton in the high school world, but there's, you know, I don't want a kid running on the field. I, and we dealt with this at the college level of a kid that's ineligible or a redshirted kid that they allow to suit up and a coach throws them in the game 
And that red shirt year is burnt because the coach didn't know that he couldn't play or he was ineligible. Kind of the same thing goes in the scenario here. It is better for them to not be in uniform. They should be in street clothes and they should not even be on the bench. Uh, so there's no chance of that kid going in and jeopardizing uh, the team's work. And again, that kid's eligibility any further. Let's go ahead, Amy. Um, continue to harp on our, our uh, official roster. Again, this is just more information on that. And the, the piece on this slide that I will focus on is that written medical clearance. So you've got your 22-person roster that is submitted no later than five minutes prior to the kick uh, kickoff of the game. If there is a scenario that medical clearance uh, it needs to be provided to the tournament manager that the injured player, um, yeah, who that injured player is that is coming off, who the substitute is, and that injured player won't come back until the until there's uh, documentation submitted from the medical approved medical provider for that individual. If that player, um, if the player comes off and that player is able to come back on, he has to go back on for the player that he or she has to go back on for the player that came in and substituted for them. They can't be picked for uh, another random person to come off to swap out and roster hack. Not allowed. Okay, now up to three additional personnel. These are statistics, an athletic trainer, team doctor. They are allowed, um, I would say, on the sideline, but cannot be in the bench area. Okay, so they've got to be in the technical box um, around the scores table, but they're not allowed to be a bench coach um, in, in, in that area at all. But they are allowed to have those, um, a stats, a trainer, and a team doc if they so choose. And that uh, that technical area is located behind the scores table. And then just a reminder that no students that are outside of the 7 through 12 uh, grade group should be allowed down on the field um, at any point in time. All right, so reviewing and discussing transfer of care. And um, that postseason EAP uh, protocols, we hit on the EAP aspect, the transfer of care. Those documents are in your fall sports um, file, uh, and you do have access to them to provide those to, to, um, to athletic trainers um, that, that do attend. Uh, school personnel versus tournament staff. Your tournament staff is going to have the say there. Your tournament hired athletic trainer, if that's what you have there, uh, will have that final say. And then, as I mentioned before, your return to play has got to be if you have a student athlete that is out because of injury um that return to play is with written approval from appropriate healthcare professional so that doctor that was uh that that trainer handed that student athlete over to initially is generally who would be writing that that first doc that they are working with he would he or she would be writing that um that return to play uh piece that would be submitted to you um as I mentioned, the, the section assigned medical provider has the say for all medical decisions uh, there on site. And then again, pre-contest timeout hits on some of these different things. That's why we've been pushing this a ton because we're able to get that information kind of determined before the contest even starts. So that if it comes down to it, it's like, oh, who do we look to for this? Boom. Where do we go for that? Boom. It's already taken care of and it's less confusion that we need to, to, um, to, to kind of navigate when the bullets are flying. Let's go on to the next one, Amy. Okay, inclement weather. Um, hit on our our weather policy that is in our governance documents. You can find that one there. I believe it is also located in your fall tournament section, your fall section manager's guide as well. In that file, we've got the entire weather document right there for you to be able to utilize. Um, so nothing too crazy there, nothing outside of the box of what has happened in the past for you. Um, only region approved merchandise can be sold at games. Um, so there should be nothing, no odd, odd stuff going on your section side. Work with your region secretary to make sure that um, that you're you're following their guidelines on that. Um, just good communication there. If there's anything, anything that you might have um, questions on, connect with that region secretary on it. I know. Uh, at the state tournament side of things like the the uh, you know different fundraising things that schools like to do or different things on those are are prohibited um, when you're working with your region secretary most of the time they're gonna they're gonna mirror what we're doing but just make sure you're communicating with them if questions come up around that type of stuff all right um, 
now as we wrap up here, um, the when, when the section champion is determined and we're starting to work towards that qualifying schools meeting, um, all of that information will be shared and sent electronically to those qualifying schools. Uh, it is important to get your scores and your brackets updated as soon as possible because as soon as that stuff happens, Amy Ince, uh, Scott and Emmett, uh, Amy Ince, Greg Juba, and Scott and Emmett and I are all getting to work on what those communications look like to the uh, to the qualifying school. So please make sure that that information is updated as quickly as possible. Um, we've got a ton of different things that are going on around electronic ticketing, um, stuff with our qu different quarterfinal sites uh, that are all over, basically loop around the Metro. And then also we have a meeting that's just for those teams that qualify for the semifinals and finals that are held at U.S. Bank Stadium because the logistics for that are a little bit different. So the sooner we can get an idea of what who our qualifying schools are, the better. Um, and we'll, we'll send all that information to them. There's no little brown box anymore that the AD used to get. Uh, it, that will all come via electronic communication out of our office here, largely from Amy Ince, um, on when those meetings are, what requirements are needed from those qualifying schools, and uh, the time frames for all of those, like the medium and the time frame, you know, Zoom versus, you know, Teams or whatever have you. So all of that stuff will come from us here, and they'll be communicated. So just advise them to keep an eye on the email, because those are going to be coming through. Um, and then they should be in communication with their AD to make sure that one of the two of them are, are getting that information. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to pass this or just, I should say at least open this up to Amy Emmett, Scott or Juba. I believe Greg, you're still on the call to see if there's anything that I missed that, uh, that section managers will want to be aware of, uh, in the conducting of their postseason tournament. Bill, this is Emmett. I, the only thing that, and we ask this of you, uh, it helps us a lot um, if you are consistent with the policies, um, you know, as, as much as you possibly can be throughout the tournament. Um, <clears throat> certainly, you know, those first round high seed games, those might look a little different, but by the time we get to the section finals, if, um, if we can adhere to the policies of who's on the bench, all of the different things, it just makes life easier when one of those teams comes to U.S. Bank Stadium <clears throat> and, we, you know, if we say to them, you know, you can only have three on the bench and, you know, their response to us is, well, at the section final, we got to have five, you know, well, and, you know, our response is going to be, well, you're not at the section final today, but it just helps if we can develop that consistency of approach all the way through. So any help there is greatly appreciated. Thanks, Emmett. Scott, anything? Yeah, I'll just tack one on. This happened to me a couple times this year, and this is more broad, not just soccer, but more outdoor sports. Have that communication ahead of time with your trainer as far as the lightning, thunder, weather type things. We had a deal this year, and our trainer meant well, but I turned my back for a second. I was looking at the lightning, and, and he said, hey, I see it on my app. It's 12 miles away or whatever, and he walked out, and, and he pulled the team. And I said, wait a minute, I haven't seen anything. We're actively looking. I mean, it was just an awkward thing. I talked to Jason Nickleby about some of this and some of the protocols, but it's just good ahead of time to not have that awkward situation come up so that you're on the same page. And, you know, he, he didn't do the wrong thing. It just felt weird because I wasn't expecting him to just go out there and pull the plug without consulting with me. And we hadn't really seen anything yet. He saw it on the app, whatever. So it's just good to get that done ahead of time. Yeah, that's really where the power of some of that stuff with that pre that pre contest timeout comes in, so that you can get an agreement on how those situations will be handled. So, um, you know, I know I've probably said pre contest timeout fifty times on this call, uh, but it does handle a lot of, uh, I guess, preemptive situations. So let's uh, let's make sure we're utilizing that kind of stuff and, and having those conversations prior to it, so it's not a situation like Scott had to deal with there. So. Um, uh, seeing everyone on here, I think everyone's got my contact information in some way, shape, or form. Um, Amy, you want to throw that slide back up? Uh, and then if there's any questions or anything, we've got a relatively small group. If anyone has anything, I'm, I'm happy to take them. We're right at 1044. I want my target was to be done at 45. So um, 
if they're there's my contact info uh again most people i'm seeing who are on this call right now should already have that um but if you don't please take that down and know that you can communicate with me that way or through your region secretary uh whatever works the best for you so um are there any questions or anything that we could open up amy i think they have the ability to unmute themselves if not you can throw it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll get you um but pretty straightforward again i, I thank you for your your uh your work that you're you're committing to do with us and and uh, don't take that lightly. And I'm here to help out and try and make that as easy as possible uh, for you and the folks that you're going to be hiring to run this tournament. So with that, uh, if I see no hands, nothing in the chat, let me double check the chat and no one on muting with that, we're going to call it. Um, congrats. Thank you, and have a great section tournament. Appreciate it. Have a good night.